Welcome to Talking Industrial Automation, a podcast where you get to know the people who make modern industrial automation possible. You will get to hear from CSIA system integrators and industry partners to get a better understanding of how they help their clients solve process challenges and how they've earned success in their careers. Along the way, we will touch on system integration best practices, technology, trends, and challenges. Whether you are a manufacturer, end user, supplier, or system integrator, you will enjoy the insights these industry professionals bring to this podcast. Let's get started. Hi, my name is Lisa Richter, the host of Talking Industrial Automation, a podcast where you get to know the people who make modern industrial automation and processing possible. In today's episode, we're talking industrial automation with Kirk Biles, CEO of FreeWave Technologies, a provider of wireless machine-to-machine solutions that deliver access to data for companies in the industrial Internet of Things markets. Under Kirk's leadership, FreeWave is pivoting from a discrete radio manufacturer to an IIoT solutions provider with a dynamic edge computing platform. Prior to his appointment to CEO, Kirk was Senior Vice President of Worldwide Sales at FreeWave, where he restructured the sales and support teams to prepare for the burgeoning IIoT market. Before FreeWave, Kirk led global sales and marketing organizations at Rayjant Corporation, Firetide, Relevant Security, Motorola, and Proxene Corporation. At these companies, he was often responsible for providing leadership in a startup situation or helping to realign the company for a successful exit. He has a technical background in wireless, networking, and security technologies and experience as an executive sales leader, employee motivator, and consensus builder, all of which should serve him well in his new role at FreeWave. Kirk, welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Lisa. I really appreciate you having me on. So let's start off by a fairly simple one, I think, and that is, how do you describe to lay people what you do? Well, what I do (laughs) is lead from a remote office in the mountains, but what FreeWave does is uh, pretty interesting, really. We've got a 27-year history of working in the industrial uh, markets, in particular oil and gas, utilities, water, wastewater, and we do quite a bit on the military side where we work with uh, robotics teams and, and drones and such. And traditionally, we've been just that robust, narrow band communications link. And when I say narrow band, I'm, I'm assuming people understand that, but very, very small bits of data going back and forth, often working with SCADA systems or command and control systems. And that served us very well for 25 years. Great little company, uh, different variations of ownership along the way. And uh, when I came on board about four years ago uh, running sales, the idea was to let's start pivoting the company more towards IIoT in the, in the edge. And we were developing a, a piece of hardware, again, a, a radio hardware in the narrowband world that would allow us to do some compute on the edge. And it was really interesting as a radio company, we didn't quite understand what we were getting into at the time. Uh, we pulled in our, our group of um, customer committee to talk through some of this stuff. And they all said, Hey, you're crazy. What are you, what are you thinking? You know, <laughs> what are we going to do on the edge? And uh, lo and behold, we said, this is what we, we believe in and we're going to move forward with it. And a couple of years later, some, you know, starts and stops and fits and everything else. Uh, we have produced a really cool little product out there that uh, people are using to compute on the edge and uh, load applications out there, whether it's oil and gas or uh, utilities running different type of things, maybe a flow computer or um, a protocol conversion and such. Do you specialize in any industry or product or discipline? You know, wireless is such a broad-based um, technology. So for the narrowband pieces and what we do, we really focused on the the long distance, rugged outdoor markets. And in particularly uh, early on in our, our evolution, we got involved with the oil and gas vertical. 
and have continued to, to really shine there. I would say we're probably the number one vendor in oil and gas uh, for narrowband wireless. But we also made sure we stuck to those sort of principles. We understood SCADA systems and um, some of the proprietary languages that were out there. So even though oil and gas on the commercial side made up uh, the vast majority of our business early on, we've been able over the years to diversify into a number of the other industrial uh, verticals that I mentioned before, utilities, water, wastewater, um, and then certainly uh, we're doing some pretty cool stuff in the drone world in the past and currently. So that's, that's always a nice place to be. How would you say FreeWave has grown or changed in the past year? And what do you expect for your company in the next 12 to 24 months? Wow. It's uh, <laughs> the year of the COVID has done some real uh, soul searching on our end. Well, I'll tell you, we, we started out uh, the year 2020 with a, a bunch of what I would call legacy products and product lines. And they were getting a little bit long in the tooth, uh, meaning we couldn't find some of the components we needed and so forth. So we we decided that we would do a, uh, a pretty big uh, uplift of these legacy products and rebuild them from the ground up to be backward compatible with everything else we have out in the marketplace. So we, we set out on that uh, late December and we're able to finish that off uh, in September, which was fantastic. And what that allowed us to do is take a whole nother section of the engineering team and really focus on the edge. And, and what does that mean? How do we make it simple for people to put their applications out on a, an edge computer in the middle of nowhere and be able to get that data back and forth without having to be a broadband connection? So we were still talking about, you know, 900 megahertz products at that point. Along the way, in about uh, July timeframe, we decided we decided before that, back in probably December timeframe, that we wanted to do an acquisition of a, of a software company that focused on proprietary protocols, um, maybe had some a software suite, some virtual applications. Uh, we were able to do that in July which was fantastic. We, we brought on a, a smaller company with a very robust uh, software solution set, been around for about 25 years in many different iterations. And we were able to uh, bring them on and integrate them pretty quickly. So now you can see on our, um, our edge computers come native with protocol converters. So if you've got a you know, a Honeywell, an Emerson, uh, uh, Allen Bradley products out in the field somewhere, instead of having to build up multiple networks, you can now pull it all into one of our edge computers. We'll convert whatever proprietary language is being brought in, put it into whatever language you want it to come out in and be able to pull it back into the cloud. So that was a real big thing for us this year to change Freeway from, you know, more or less a widget manufacturer and OEM to becoming a real fairly robust software application company, as well as we have a full SCADA suite that we're, we're updating right now and, and have a, a decent run going right now where folks are looking at that, as well as what FreeWave offers on the hardware side. And then going forward, we are developing and will launch here in February a whole new platform for FreeWave that gets us away from simply a narrowband communications technology to a very modular type of edge computer that will allow just about any communications technology to be on board, actually up to three different communications technologies on board at the, on a single platform as well as do the compute and, and edge applications. So for us, um, this has been the biggest leap forward in FreeWave's 27 year history. It really has been uh, all of this while the COVID has been crushing everybody and we had to move, you know, like, like everybody did, you know, move from most everybody working in the office to completely remote. I, I, I give the team great kudos. Uh, our engineering guys jumped on board, did everything they could do. Our sales team, marketing, finance, manufacturing, especially 
it's been a real team effort and I'm looking forward to see what 2021 brings us. Are your accounting systems optimized for the needs of your system integration business? Do you understand the KPIs critical to business performance? And are you prepared to proactively manage your short and long-term cash needs while minimizing your tax liabilities? Well, I've got some super exciting news to share about a brand new CSIA financial checkup program brought to you by long-term member Clayton and McCurvey, CPAs for System Integrators. Now, if you are a CSIA member, you will have access to this exclusive program designed to bring you support in four key financial areas, accounting systems, performance metrics, tax planning, and cash management. Plus, CSIA has negotiated special member pricing and packages at various price points to fit your budget. Clayton and McCurvey has helped many CSIA members over the years and is super excited to help you improve your financial performance through this program. To learn more, visit www.controlsys.org backslash check. So you mentioned the acquisition, but are there other decisions that you made recently that you would think of as a smart thing you did or, you know, any other smart decisions you've made recently? Yeah. I would, besides um, bringing on some real high level talent in the engineering side, which was, uh, you know, everybody wants to do that. We were lucky enough to be able to bring on some, some folks that are, are rock solid. Uh, the other piece we decided to do with, when COVID hit, uh, we realized our legacy our biggest legacy customers, uh, many of whom were in the oil and gas and that market collapsed, weren't going to be doing a lot of business with us this year. So we took a look at what we wanted to do and where we were going and realized, you know, the vast majority of our business was the U.S. and Canada. It was very much narrow band radio business. So we took the opportunity to completely realign our marketing, sales and support teams to go out and start tracking uh, new customers and getting new customers uh, engaged, maybe not buying yet, but at least saying, hey, let's go develop Latin America. Uh, let's get over into uh, Asia, Australia, so forth and so on, and, and Europe. So we made a pretty good investment in going out to develop those markets. Uh, in many cases, because of the proprietary nature of our narrowband products, there wasn't a whole lot we could offer these customers to date. But what we ended up finding out was there were a lot of customers we'd never ta- spoken to that did want narrowband. And there were any number of customers that loved our story and were willing to give us a ton of feedback on the direction we should go with our roadmap. And that's been a huge help for us. Getting outside of our comfort zone was difficult. We had to make some, some hard choices uh, but when it started to roll along, it's been amazing. We've had more new customers buying this year than we've had in the last 20. Uh, it's really, really impressive. And a lot of more tire kickers for sure. You know, it's that 80-20 rule. If we can get, you know, 20% of these guys to be consistent customers, that would be really amazing. So, again, looking forward to 2021 when we can deliver on the new products with the software suite and uh, some of these applications. Yeah, anytime you can have anything successful in, in a year like 2020, you got to give yourself a giant pat on the back, man. <laughs> exactly. It is, uh, it was, we, we could have just curled up in a ball on the floor and just, you know, held out for the bid to be over with. But instead, uh, we really put a, a new plan in place across the board. Uh, soup to nuts. Uh, the manufacturing team took a lot of time to go, what, you know, what haven't we been able to get done uh, to make us more efficient in the past. So they took time to really, you know, shore up the manufacturing processes. Our finance team jumped on board our new ERP system to really fine tune that, yada, yada, yada. It just just gave, um, it gave us a chance to breathe and really take a look at where we were going, what we really wanted to do over the next three to five years and to say, all right, there's, there's no excuses. There's no 
you know, all of our legacy customers are being well handled and maintained. We got their products set up. Let's put everybody over on the other side of the house and move forward quickly, make some decisions. And that's been a, it's been a real, uh, it's been a challenge, but it's, it's wonderful. I can see so much light at the end of the tunnel for 2021 and and beyond. What do you see the role of IIoT and data collection playing in the future of industrial automation? It, it's going to be massive. I mean, it, it already, you know, in, in the manufacturing side, it's, you know, taking off quite a bit. And you, you see a lot of it in the pharmaceutical side where we focus, you know, that, that outdoor sort of operational technology. Uh, there's been a lot of tire kickers uh, along the way and, and things are getting deployed for sure, but it has not even come close to what was going to happen in the next few years with all the various applications coming on board, um, the, the different ways people are handling data at the edge, making those decisions using artificial intelligence, and then just sending it back, just that change data to the cloud. I'm, I'm very excited. And, that, and that's where we're looking to develop and invest in as well as is, is some sort of AI uh, on board the edge. We partner with a few few companies right now that are doing some really neat stuff focused mostly now on trying to find, you know, what is the next thing that's going to happen in a couple, three years. We don't want to do too much of fast follow anymore. Uh, We've been doing that for a little bit. And I think that's going to be where a lot of the larger companies have been focused more on the indoor IOT market, or maybe the, you know, your, thermostat, your, you know, all the stuff that you see daily, where that's now trickled down into the operational technology side. Hey, we don't need to buy this piece of hardware. We can just write the software, put it on an edge computer with five other applications, and we can run an entire well site or, you know, a remote utility RTU or something of that sort. So it's, it's going to be very interesting, and uh, I, I do feel we've we've made some some smart moves along the way to get us prepared for that. So we're certainly seeing significant advances in how data is captured and transported and visualized. What are the key drivers behind these advances in data collection? Part of it is, you know, if, if you've <laughs> we just went through a process of moving twenty five years of data from eighty different servers to the cloud. That was a very expensive proposition. And as we continue to create more and more data, we're looking at ways to reduce that overall. And, and what do we really need? And I think that's going to be a, one of the major drivers is most of these uh, operational folks have been able to collect data and get little bits back and forth. But, and that's been fine for 50 years. That's been absolutely just fine for everybody if they need more information, they send a guy out into the field and he goes and collects it and brings it back. IIoT and data in general, like anything, they're seeing massive amounts of desire to get more information in real time so they can make honest adjustments either to equipment into the field or even back inside, uh, you know, in the HR office or in the finance office. They want to see things and be able to make those adjustments. We, we were working on a project where we were doing artificial intelligence on a well pad, and we weren't sending video back. We were just sending back the data of, you know, how many people were wearing helmets on site versus who weren't. You know, these were OSHA type issues for regulatory folks and the HR team was saying, hey, this is a problem for us. Is there a way for us to document that, you know, we're meeting code 99% of the time without, you know, having to put fiber all the way out to this remote site or, you know, a long distance broadband link. And we were able to show them exactly that. So when you when you look at that, you go, okay, the data was never really It was collected, it was held on to for 30 days, but what was really sent back over that link was you're at 95%, 95%, 95%. So the data was much reduced because it was doing everything it needed and it would alarm if it said, hey, it's fallen below 95%. 
and they could go get that data and say, okay, this is what happened. So I do believe, you know, there'll be lots more data being generated in these remote areas, but I don't think it's going to be transmitted or transported. It's going to be manipulated, stored, and then the end results will be pushed back into the cloud or the closet. Well, we're doing it. We're rolling out all the new value CSIA has for system integrators and vendor partners this year. If you haven't heard, we've completely revamped our content delivery strategy for 2021 to include weekly virtual events that will continue the CSIA tradition of knowledge sharing, community building, and networking, but also capitalize on the opportunities and innovation digital delivery offers. The best part is, this online strategy means anyone from your company, from the newbies to the seasoned pros, will have access to education and content that would have normally been out of reach. Don't worry, we still have all the other goodies that come with CSIA membership, including the highly valued best practices, professional services discounts, and benchmarking, training, and a completely revamped marketing toolbox. All this with no dues increase over 2020. To learn more, visit www.controlsys.org backslash join-2021. Let's do this. What's unique about how you approach a project? We, uh, it, it's been really funny. So we, over the years, we've been very much focused on two different go-to-market strategies. Our OEM strategy, where we've been selling uh, radios to any number of industrial companies. Um, you throw out a name, they're probably using a, a free wave radio in one of their products somewhere. And then we've gone to market with uh, smaller integrators as well as some larger ones. But the smaller ones have shown that they're, they're more willing to uh, take on some of these more diverse and uh, how would I say, uh, not necessarily difficult, but um, opportunities that may not be as bountiful as some of the larger ones. You know, we, we certainly work with the Chevrons and the BPs and, you know, the XL Energies and all that stuff, but they typically have their own guys and they run their crews and we aren't much help to them in the sense of, you know, we train them on our stuff and they go off to the races and they do that. Where on the the smaller side of the house, we're more involved in the day-to-day with those folks and some of their customers to make sure that they're getting the experience that they want to have. And that's been great for us to pull that information back into FreeWave and push it back out other sides, whether it's, you know, internationally or into our OEM markets as they're building up products along the way. That's traditionally been the way we've been going about doing it. Of late, uh, we've we've started working quite a bit with um, Amazon Web Services with their folks to come up with uh, ways to get data into the cloud, work with their folks to make sure that our applications that we're developing and running meet their demand with their customers. And now we're hopefully going to be start working, going hand in hand into their integration partners saying, hey, here's a real nice way to put it all together for your customers. So um, the hope is to, you know, learn and grow with AWS and then, you know, potentially take it into other cloud providers along the way. And, um, you know, world domination. Yay. <laughs> it can happen. <laughs> Uh, so tell us why your customers return to you project after project. Well, that's really one of the, the easier questions. Um, we make a great product. Uh, we we are ISO certified. We build everything in Colorado in our Boulder facility, engineer it all right there. So when it comes off the line, it, it is a rock solid product. And we've been building these things for to last forever. Uh, we we still get product people calling up on our very first product, which was uh, a DRG product. Or is that right? DGR. Gosh, I screwed that up. DGR, uh, which is over 20 years old, and people are still using it. So people find a product that works and works and works. They come back to it. And we're also one of the few companies that still – 
we do all of our tech support in-house in Boulder, Colorado. We have a 24-hour hotline. People call in all the time. We pick up the phone. You're talking to someone that's quite literally probably been in the field the day before helping folks install or troubleshoot. So there is no, hey, I, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So customer service is, is a big piece for us. And we we actually continue to invest on that side of the house that uh, it's a real differentiator for the, when you're talking with, you know, someone that may be imagined is working with a multi-billion dollar industrial company and they can call FreeWave and they, we get questions on everybody's product, not just our own. You know, I, I need to talk to, you know, XYZ person. I know he knows this stuff and we get him on the phone and, you know, he can configure a, you know, an Emerson rock to go with a free wave product and, and all that stuff along the way. So uh, we've become very valuable and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll continue to be that way with our customers. What advice would you give to a prospective customer researching you versus your competitors? You know, I would, I would certainly have them question, you know, the, the viability of the companies they're working with. That's always one newer companies are, are popping up all the time. It seems so that's always a nice piece. And then the, just the overall know-how and um, support that they're going to get, no matter what happens, you, you need the support out there. So we certainly provide that. And then the flexibility. We are, with our, our latest platform, the, the ability to adjust, change, tweak the product for what people want specifically is built into the product. That was one of the things that we were known for for years is a customer saying, well, it'd be great if we had a, a Phoenix connector on this. And we'd be like, oh, great. Well, let, give, us, give us a few weeks. And we'd come out with a Phoenix connector. And, you know, we, we want to do the same for all of our customers going forward and make sure that if they do have, you know, whether it's custom software, hardware, um, just different ideas, that we're willing to listen and, you know, go and see, Hey, is there really a, a decent size market for this? And, and we're not a billion dollar company. So a decent size market for us is totally different than working with a, you know, a Honeywell or an Allen Bradley. We'll jump through hoops to do, you know, good things for good customers. So I think that's something people should look at as, uh, as they're looking at competitive products. A lot of it is here's what you got. This is what you're going to get. And if you need help, dial this number and you'll get somebody wherever it is in the world um, that will ask you to reboot the product versus uh, recognizing you've been through training and we know who you are and we've talked before. So challenges are your customers facing right now? You know, the, the, it's really been an interesting, this COVID thing made everything as far as all the variety of technologies that are just coming straight into everybody's faces and there was a lot of money being thrown at these technologies and everything looked great. It was flashy and wonderful. And I believe our customers just were overwhelmed, just completely sitting back going, you know, what, what do I do? How do I keep up? Is this really going to make my life better or am I going to have six months down the road, am I going to find something out about this that's going to make my life that much worse? So I, I really feel like the the technology boom went on, it's still going, but now it's sort of, it's slowed down enough with COVID and people are really having to look at, you know, is this going to help me or make everybody's life a little bit more difficult? And that slowed things down in such a way that, you know, a lot of these smaller startups have struggled a bit, which is too bad. But at the same time, it's a really allowed people to say, hey, this is, this is a technology that's going to rise up and be a part of the IIoT revolution where this one has gone to the wayside and it's not going to make it any further. And I think that's helpful for everybody right now is I know for myself, when we're looking to do acquisitions, you know, I see a few every week and I can now look at them and go, okay, that one's not going to make, make that big a difference in my life or my customers' lives where maybe a year and a half ago, I would have said, Hey, that would have been really great. But 
in the world of COVID, you know, these guys are struggling and you can say, Oh, I see that, you know, that a year and a half ago, I might have, I might have thought about, you know, picking up that company. And now I can see, Hey, that's not the right thing for, for people right now. And it's a, it's really interesting. So uh, going out and talking to folks has been a, a real highlight now in the COVID, I think probably much like yourself, back to back to back to back video calls and people are asking questions and, and providing a lot of answers. So it's nice. What kinds of trends and challenges are you seeing in industrial automation right now? Certainly the trend is to get away from proprietary uh, protocols. Uh, that's, that's been happening for a little while but it's, it's speeded up 10x over the last year or so, I would say. And that's just, you know, the Cisco's of the world have done a great job making everything standards-based inside the enterprise. And for whatever reason, you know, the, the operational technology companies have done a great job locking people into their own equipment and only their equipment and the pushback now with a, the younger, a younger generation of technology folks are coming into the industries and saying, what is wrong? Why are we doing this? And I think that's throwing a, a huge wrench into a, a business model that worked very well and continues to be multi-billions. I mean, don't get me wrong. Nobody's, none of these guys are going away but the questions are being asked and a door is opening for folks that are willing to make products be open using open standards and looking at hardware and saying, well, we don't need to do that in hardware. We can do it all in software. So, you know, as, as the enterprise has moved along very rapidly over the last 30 years, OT has moved very slowly for all the right reasons. You know, a lot of this stuff has got to be very careful with. And it also has got a lot of older men and women that are leaving now. So these young guys are coming in, uh, you know, ex-military folks that have been playing with very sophisticated equipment forever and saying, no, no, there's a better way. Let's let's go look for the better way. So I think that's the trend for the future. Who's going to who's going to really disrupt some of this stuff? And, you know, when it happens. I think everybody's going to have that aha moment. I, I'm certain every every major multinational is aware, is making plans to adjust. But it's you know, my little small company. Holy moly, it it was incredibly hard to pivot from you know what we've done in the past to where we're going in the future, and the pushback from every department and people and customers. I couldn't imagine if I was a $10 billion company, what people would be saying if I said, Hey, we're going to stop doing this tomorrow and we're going to do this. <laughs> so it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty fun times right now. I'd say. A couple of quick stats from the 2021 state of marketing to engineers report. One. Online content supports over 50% of the buyer's journey, and that number jumps to 70% in the under 45 crowd. Two, 82% of engineers find value in virtual events. What does that mean for you? Well, if you want to tap into this digital ecosystem, CSIA has you covered with multiple opportunities to sponsor our virtual events throughout 2021. Plus, we've launched new digital advertising and sponsored content products to help you reach the exclusive system integrator audience. Interested in learning more? Visit www.controlsys.org backslash 2021 opportunities. Oh, and one last piece of advice. Don't dawdle. Inventory is limited, and I'd hate to see you miss out. the biggest challenge facing the automation marketplace today and in the future? <sighs> you know, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think some of the biggest challenges they're going to have right now is, like we said, is to de define what technologies they want to embrace uh, and, and run with them. And th that's, that's always a 
an issue no matter what, you know, 20 years, 30, 40 years ago. But now, like I said, there's just so many variations of crazy smart people out there doing amazing things that at some point people are going to have to put a stake in the ground. So I think that's a real hard thing right now. And then in the future, you know, making some hard decisions, these larger multinationals, um, you know, I worked for Motorola for a number of years and I, I remember sitting in a middle managers and above meeting and there was probably a thousand of us in Schaumburg and it was a, uh, I'll just tell a story. It was, it was a great, you know, everybody was riding high. Motorola was doing great. The flip phone was a killer. And uh, the president of uh, the flip phone division, I forget what it was called, got up there and they did like a 10 minute skit making fun of the Apple phone before it was even launched. Apple had not even launched it. They said it was coming out and they did 10 minutes just, you know, making fun of like, you're going to be able to drive your, drive it like your car. You're going to be able to, you know, go to the bathroom. I mean, they just made so much fun of it. And then Apple launched that phone and it broke Motorola in half, you know, in, in about a week, Motorola was insignificant anymore. Um, I see that's, that's coming up. I think for a lot of these industrial companies is uh, folks like, well, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, folks like Amazon, Azure, you know, the cloud-based folks that are really jumping into this, but also developing hardware along the way. Uh, there's a there's a great little company, well, it's not little anymore, um, Inductive Automation, that uh, privately owned out of Sacramento, that those guys just said there's a better way. And they've been growing steadily on a hockey stick steady for the last 10 years. And... Um, I believe there's a lot of other people like inductive out there that are, you know, maybe not going into the SCADA world, but are doing things differently and they're going to be embraced. So I, I really think there'll be a, that aha moment in the industrial world coming up that uh, is going to show everybody they better change or it's going to be a tough road to hoe and look at Motorola today. So, <laughs> so my sister works for Motorola and has for, gosh, I don't know, 30 years. And we, we admire her for that. Like she right. survived so many rounds of layoffs and changes <laughs> and she's still hanging in there. So uh, great good for her. Yeah. Right. What makes FreeWave optimistic about the future of the automation industry? Oh, it's, you know, there's a couple things for, for FreeWave that are uh, unique, one of which is for most of the 20 plus years, 27 years, we've spent the vast majority of our time focused on North America. So the market for us is exponentially larger elsewhere in the world. So let's face it, the rest of the world is much larger potential. <laughs> so, so specifically to FreeWave, we look at our new platform coming out uh, that will be standards based on, on many continents and we'll be able to play where we've never been able to play before. But that the market itself isn't going away. I mean, oil and gas is taking a hit for sure, but there you are going to embrace IIoT Tech, you know, technologies even more than they have in the past. They're going to run more efficient. If the last downturn didn't show everybody, I mean, that was when FreeWave really took off is everybody said, okay, sneaker net, you know, where the guy runs around in his car and his shoes to go grab the data at each site. They're like, we can't have that. It's, it takes two weeks to get the data, then we have to process it. So they, you know, a lot of folks just put up, you know, radios to communicate with all these well sites so they could get some of the data in real time. I believe with COVID, oil and gas collapsing, the world sort of going into a wackiness right now that automation is going to continue to grow and it's going to grow in ways we haven't even thought of yet, where folks are going to look at something and go, if I could have this and then take it back to someone like a free wave that is nimble and quick and say, Hey, if I had this, I'd buy thousands of them and we would, or millions of them would be better. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that's what I see in the future is a lot of bright people coming in with crazy ideas 
and are willing to share those ideas and try and bring them to fruition. That's where free wave shines. What mistake did you make and what did you learn from it? <sighs> what mistake didn't I make? Um, <laughs> I, I made, I made a few, um, but I think one of the, one of the bigger mistakes I believe I made uh, as a first time CEO was I didn't shift quick enough. Uh, I, I took probably eight to 12 months longer than I should have. I knew what I needed to do. I knew how the company needed to, to pivot and just wasn't willing to make that sacrifice uh, out of the gate. I, I also knew that, you know, it could cripple us. So there was this a back and forth that happened, but along the way, the, the, learn, the lesson learned there was move quicker, shore up the legacy business immediately and pivot out of this thing uh, much faster. Uh, I don't think we've lost too much along the way other than time, which is important, but it, it certainly, I would like, to, I would have liked to have been a little bit further along than we are today. Finally, if you could get into a time machine and go back and visit younger Kirk, what advice would you give him? <laughs> well, younger Kirk, what advice would I give myself? You know, I, I think what it would be something of the sort of, you know, just keep moving, plan a little bit more further along. You know, it's, it's, I've always been a planner, but more three, six months type thing. Um, In this role, it's three, six months is already gone. It's more 12, 18, 24, 36. And that's where I am today is uh, I don't spend a whole lot of time on what happened yesterday or even what's right in front of me. It's more along the lines of what are we doing so we can get to where we want to be 60 months out, 36 months out and trying to play, put that sort of reverse puzzle pieces in play um, and start thinking that way. And, and I, th- I think that's important for any executive to, to learn uh, along the way. My roles in the past, uh, primarily running, you know, global sales teams, you get into that mindset of, you know, what have you done for me lately? What are we going to close this quarter or next quarter or next? And now that the role I'm in, it, that, that doesn't really have a, I don't have room for that in my role now. Other people do that and do it much better than I ever did. So, Well, that's it for today's episode of Talking Industrial Automation. If you're interested in learning more about Kirk Biles or FreeWave, you can find them on the Industrial Automation Exchange at www.csiexchange.com. Thanks for listening, and thank you, Kirk, for joining me today. Thank you, Lisa. I really enjoyed it. Have a great day. If you enjoy this podcast, please subscribe in iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also help others find us by leaving a five-star review and sharing your favorite episodes with colleagues. Thanks for listening to the Talking Industrial Automation Podcast. Thanks also to bensound.com and Wistia for the music bumpers. Until next time.